Welcome to Screens of the Stone Age, the podcast where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. My name is Josh Lindell. I'm a PhD student studying Neanderthal teeth, and I'm here with... I'm Ross Barnett, a polygeneticist specializing in Pleistocene megafauna. Okay, I'm Frederick Radovic. I'm um, from Department of Archaeology uh, at the Faculty of uh, Philosophy in Belgrade. I'm a paleoanthropologist, and I basically study hominin dentition, mostly. And uh, Kim is away on vacation today, so uh, Predrag is going to be taking her place. Predrag, we're going to call you Peja because that's the nickname that I know you by, in case any English speakers aren't familiar with uh, the nickname conventions in Serbian. Okay. And Peja, you suggested uh, the movie we're watching today, which is called... Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a a comedy movie, of course. It's it's a kind of a spoof uh, on on some more of serious movies. You know, it's about basically a band of Paleolithic humans who use shampoo and try to figure out uh, who committed like the first murder in history. So it should be funny, I guess. Uh, yeah, that description probably makes no sense. A band of oh, humans yeah. who use shampoo and try and solve a murder. Yeah, but you'll see. <laughs> Can you uh, remember it well enough to give a more in-depth summary, or uh, should one of us go into a little more detail, having watched it more recently? Okay, uh, I actually watched the movie a long, long time ago, but uh, I remember um, basically that uh, there are a lot of guys named Pierre, <laughs> and uh, like virtually every animal in a movie has tusks, of course. So that's about it for me, you know. It was a fun watch, though. Uh, well, I watched it this morning, so I can do a uh, slightly longer um, overview if, if that works, Josh. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Ur, which I think can canonically has seven R's in the title. Uh, which makes it quite difficult to search for on Google. Um, but it's set, Three exclamation marks, too. And exclama two exclamation marks. Uh, but it's set 35,000 BC, apparently, where there is the land of mammoths, but also uh, horse moths and hen moths and worm moths and all other kinds of animals which have tusks. And uh, as it just says, the, everyone is called Pierre, which apparently is hilarious in French because Pierre uh, can also mean stone. I mean, that makes sense. Peter is Latin for stone, so there you go. But living in the Stone Age and having everybody called stone, um, I guess that's quite amusing. Um, and th th there's kind of two tribes. It's one of those um, uh, kind of Stone Age films which sets up a kind of rivalry between two tribes. And there's the the Clean Hairs, which is uh, the main kind of tribe that we're focusing on. And there's the Dirty Hairs, which are led by, of course, uh, Gerard Depardieu. Uh, you can't make a French film without him, it seems. Uh, and so the, the kind of conflict is set up because the Dirty Hairs want this, to steal the secret of shampoo, like some kind of uh, Prometheus um, cosmetics uh, school from from the Clean Hairs. Uh, and they're very inept at, at trying to, to do this. They've been at war for 800 years to get the secret of shampoo and still haven't managed but while all this is going on, the, the clean hairs are kind of hunting and gathering, and there's two kind of layabouts who don't really want to take part in the hunting and gathering called uh, Pierre and Pierre. The one has a nickname Blondie because he has blonde hair, whereas all the other of the clean hairs are uh, kind of brownish brunettes. Uh, and basically, what happens is they sort of send um, the dirty hairs shear a sheep and kind of do their best to, to make one of the daughters of the dirty hairs look like a clean hair to go and s seduce one of the clean hairs and steal the secrets of shampoo from them, um, which which sets up a lot of the conflict in the film. She she kind of goes over and, and ingratiates herself with the clean hairs and, and seduces one of them to try and get the secret of shampoo. But while all this is going on, uh, the first ever murder in the history of the world occurs, uh, which we see is... is um, done by the the clean hairs group uh heelologist which is their name for a kind of uh shaman sort of doctor and he kills the uh the tribe's babysitter 
um, who we'd seen earlier doing her babysitting jobs. And so he, he clubs her to death. Uh, and there, there follows like a very inept um, murder investigation by the Stone Age uh, clean hairs. But the, the uh, heliologist doesn't stop at one murder. He's also the first uh, serial murderer in history. So after killing the, the tribe's uh, babysitter, he also kills the tribe's digologist, which is their kind of proto-archaeologist who, who has lots of fun digging around in the ground looking for evidence of earlier peoples. Oh, I, I, I remember I remember that that, that part yeah. definitely. He said like <laughs> uh, other other peers said like what are you excavating the first people, but we are the first people or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he goes the way of the babysitter, he gets clubbed to death as well. And so main Pierre and Blondie and the chief of the of the of the clean hairs are basically trying to find out who the murderer is despite him being very obvious and kind of giving himself away at every kind of turn. But they're played as the sort of stereotypically stupid um, Stone Age characters who don't follow all these clues. Um, but somehow they kind of luck into, they have a, a kind of telephone conversation over the plains using their Stone Age telephone. Uh, and the, the murderer tells them that he's going to kill again. And they're able to work out by enhancing the background sounds that he was uh, calling from a bog. And so they go and stake out the bog to to try and capture the murderer in the act. Uh, and while this is happening, um, Blondie has a flashback to when he was younger, well, when he was out, you know, driving in inverted commas. They're they're kind of just pretending to be in a car, um, which I found actually the funniest part of the film. Th- these uh, four people in a car, uh, like running around as if they're they're driving. And in the back, there's uh, Blondie and the chief's wife who are, who are kind of making out. And in the front, driving, is the digologist and the babysitter. And while they're driving along, they accidentally run over the helologist's uh, dog, who ends up being stuffed. Dogmoth. Yeah, dogmoth, <laughs> sorry, his tusked uh, dog. <laughs> and so one of the clues that they've overlooked in their murder investigation is that all of the murder victims end up being kind of primitively taxidermied and sort of have their their um, mouths and ears and toes sewn up, which is exactly like has happened to uh, the helologist's dog. So here we have, finally, a motive and a reason for, for these murders taking place. It's it's Essentially, it's a Stone Age version of, I know what you did last summer, um, except instead <laughs> of who can, it's the, the helologist. So now that Blondie's figured this out, uh, him and Pierre and the chief go to to get the uh, helologist. Um, and while they're doing this, they uh, he actually is about to kill the chief's wife. Um, but while he's sneaking up on her and about to, to uh, club her to death as well, he falls into a trap which had been set by some of the dirty hairs who have a long history of trying to trap the clean hairs to get their shampoo secret. And so he's now stuck at the bottom of, of the... Um, of the trap that the dirty hairs have dug. Uh, and so this leads to the dirty hairs going up in estimation of the clean hairs. And so they willingly give them the secret of shampoo as thanks for capturing the first serial killer uh, in history. And it ends with a, with a celebration where um, they all jump in the water and use shampoo the, for the first time. And it turns out that the dirty hairs are actually all blonde. And that Blondie, the <laughs> only blonde member of the clean hair tribe, had been adopted and was actually the son of Gerard Depardieu and a chimpanzee. Uh, and then at the end, we see uh, as a little kind of vignette, uh, the the helologist manages to escape from the pit that he's fallen into uh, using his hair like Rapunzel to kind of pull himself up by his own bootstraps. But then he gets eaten by a dinosaur and that's the end of the film. Oh, the <laughs> dinosaurs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, It's very French, I think is the way I would describe it. Incredibly, incredibly French. Right, right. Josh, so uh, what was like the longest time you have to shampooed your hair? And do you remember <laughs> that feeling? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so I like once, how Josh uh, is getting picked on here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I wanted to share my story. So it was basically on a on, on field, archaeological field, right? So I had to wash my hair for like a week or so. And it was so damn itchy, and the feeling when I got <laughs> finally to shower, 
and to use the precious shampoo. I, I c- <laughs> kind of get the point of, you know, those paleolithic guys uh, who don't have the access to the precious liquid, you know. I'm kind of surprised because I wash my hair with shampoo about once a week normally, so <laughs> what? I don't don't want to overwash it. You have to get some uh, natural oils. That's how you have the nice hair. Okay, so for the listeners, Peja and I uh, t- typically have long hair most of the time. I think we don't have very long hair right now, but normally we have long hair, so we know what we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, by a process of elimination, I have hardly any hair, um, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the normal format for this show is that we uh, start by nitpicking the scientific inaccuracies. Um, this is a goofy comedy where it's all just jokes. So that's uh, difficult to do, but I don't know if there's anything that uh, we want to comment on that's uh, scientifically inaccurate. We said that at the end he gets eaten by a dinosaur, mm-hmm. which is not a realistic dinosaur. It had... No kind of like mammoth tusks but they were more like horns coming <laughs> off the side of its head uh it's not any kind of real dinosaur that was really crappy cgi as well i mean i was yeah. i was yeah. okay with it i can see the kind of uh, comedy value of having you know uh tusked hens and tusked ducks and tusked goats and everything then why not at the end make it like a you know a saber-toothed cat or something else i'd, I'd just if you're going to set up the internal logic to be that it's exactly the same, except you have mammoths and everything's got, got tusks, then why bring a dinosaur in the end when that's totally unnecessary and it's just going to annoy pedantic uh, archaeo paleo people? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like that's going to annoy anyone after all that's tusks and everything yeah. else. Yeah, so, so it's sort, so, sort of uh, a French uh, adult version of the Flintstones, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, f- I felt it was pretty similar to the uh, Ringo Starr Caveman movie, except uh, not as awful. It was actually pretty funny in a lot of places, but they pull some of the same jokes. Like um, there's the scene where they meet the um, the dirty hair for the first time and her name is Guy, but everyone in their tribe is named Pierre and they can't fathom <laughs> someone who's not named Pierre and they're having so much trouble trying to pronounce the name Guy. Uh, There was a similar scene in um, the Ringo Starr movie where they uh, have the guy who's speaking English and uh, he's trying to teach them the English words for everything and they're having trouble pronouncing these English words. So I I was seeing the similarity there. I think it was going for the same... They're both going for the same kind of humor, but I think this one succeeds a little bit better. Or maybe the Ringo Starr movie is just too old and it's uh, too dated at this point. Well, there's also... I think there's like a direct uh, cribbing as well from from the caveman film where they're all in the water they're all kind of there's a scene in, in caveman as well i think where they're they're kind of messing about in the water and somebody drowns which is similar to this film as well yeah cool so 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 the the actual age of of the of the fabula is like thirty five thousand years ago or right yeah so it's basically like early upper paleolithic yeah, I don't know if we can actually situate it any better um, because normally we would use uh, the types of animals or plants to situate it. But of course, these are mostly just domesticated animals with tusks in this one, <laughs> like horses and hens. Uh, they have uh, Upper Paleolithic cave paintings that are yeah. not just inspired yeah. by Lasco, but like directly like identical. Uh, there's a post credit scene. Did you guys notice that? No, I didn't. Mm-hmm. What's the post credit scene? Uh, in the post credit scene, there is um, uh, someone painting the one, that one horse from Lasco that's really uh, well known, uh-huh. and uh, his wife is commenting about how the proportions are all wrong and it's not very realistic. And he's like, "You don't think this is going to last for for thousands of years? This is just a doodle on the wall." And then he gets frustrated <laughs> and scratches over it. <laughs> Yeah, I did notice that they, they do show the cave art in, in one uh, sequence, but they also, apart from the Lasco stuff, on the right-hand side, there's some mammoths that are exact replica of the ones at Rufinia, which are uh, very kind of stylistically distinct and, and quite obvious if you, if you know them, which I thought was quite nice. So they've, they've taken two uh, kind of Paleolithic cave sites and, and used them as their inspiration for, for the cave art in this film. Cool. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought it was a, there, apart from everyone in the the clean hair is being called Pierre, 
there's a quite a lot of kind of naming jokes. So the chief of the Dirty Hairs dies quite early on in the film, uh, and they kind of bury him in a way which is reminded me of um, the uh, what's it called the the site at Sierra de Adapuerca, the the bone cave there. Cima de los Huesos. Cima de los Huesos. That's right. Oh, yeah, um, where they basically the drop bones. him down a, a kind of fissure which is what they think was done there in terms of kind of intentional burying. Uh, but the, the, we discover when he's being buried that the, the dead chief of the dirty hairs was called Lucy, um, which was quite funny. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. I remember Gerard Depardieu was, was actually great in the movie. I like the actor anyway. So no, he's in pretty much everything. Uh, I think it's maybe a, a bylaw that he has to be. So now that he's a Russian citizen, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, really? He's a Russian citizen. No, oh, he's a major <laughs> arsehole. He's a total. He's a total <laughs> dick, um, and he's he's oh. uh, in protest at French tax laws. He's become a Russian citizen as friends with Putin. So he's a total peer, right? Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Well, not not cool, definitely. But okay. Mm. He's actually a uh, a kind of. Well, I had inklings. I think when I was doing my PhD, which is mainly on uh, issues with lions, there was a story that came out while I was writing up. I think he'd actually he's always kind of giving out like these crazy stories from his life. Um, uh, one of them was that when he was younger, he'd been working in West Africa or filming in West Africa, uh, and without <clears throat> without any kind of permissions, he'd killed two lions. Um, and there's only like five or six hundred West African lions left. Um, which are kind of totally protected. Um, okay. But he came out with the story how he'd, he'd shot two lines um, just because in West Africa, which was also not cool. Okay, definitely not a fun boy any, anymore. You know, he's he's not a good guy, obviously. <laughs> no, but, you know, he can act, that's for sure. Yeah. Did you have any uh, nitpicks, Josh? Well, it's hard to <clears throat> do that for this movie because everything is just... Uh goofy it's not uh trying to do anything serious yeah i guess we can just move on to more real life stuff in it so we've already talked about the cave paintings which do seem to be directly inspired by real life and i also noticed the the uh burial practice the parallels to cima de los huesos which I'm not sure was intentional because I felt like it was played for humor that their funeral was just throwing the guy into the crevice. Mm. But uh, it's funny that uh, it turns out that that's probably a, a real burial practice at Cima de los Huesos. Of course, Cima de los Huesos is almost a half a million years old, and this is 35,000 years old. So I don't know if we would expect the same kind of burials mm. for what's pre presumably an upper Paleolithic society here. Yeah, but the whole movie just has like commingled different uh, epochs and stuff. <laughs> so I don't expect them to be very, you know, there's Lucy, there are dinosaurs. So, yeah, that's pretty uh, typical of a lot of these caveman movies that we've watched. But uh, it mostly wasn't actually that bad. Like they only had the one dinosaur right at the end, uh, <laughs> which is kind of a throwaway joke. But they... I mean, other movies like the Ringo Starr movie had dinosaurs featured all the way through, mm -hmm. or like, um, 60, was there a Raquel Welch 60, one? Five million years BC, one million years BC, one million years BC. One million years BC. Yeah. So it was actually pretty nice that they didn't feature dinosaurs more heavily. I feel like maybe that was just a, a budgetary thing because they did have mammoths at the beginning, but then afterwards, every animal was just a regular animal with some prosthetic <laughs> tusks. Yeah. Imagine your job being to stick prosthetic tusks onto a duck and a chicken. <laughs> uh, I mean, how, how does that go? I mean, I've got chickens and they're not the easiest to manhandle at the best of times, uh, but I wouldn't like to try sticking tusks on them. I mean, even the pigs and the goats and the <laughs> that sheep. That sounds strange. <laughs> All of them. But the, the, the CGI mammoths at the beginning were pretty terrible, and the CGI dinosaur at the end was also pretty terrible. Whereas the, the, the tusked ducks were pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so it must have been a, just a filmmaking choice to have not terrible looking animals and get a joke out of it every time. Yeah. But I, I really like the style of humor that they used, where they have a lot of long running jokes where they're kind of funny at first, but every time you see them, 
it's just like a little reminder. So they start off with a description that it's the time of mammoths, but also horse myths and uh, hen myths and worm myths. And you're like, haha, okay, <laughs> that's funny. But then between every scene, there's a little establishing shot where they just have another animal walking around with tusks, like a <laughs> duck or a sheep or a, uh, other things like that. And I just gets funnier to me every time also the whole idea that everyone is named pierre because it's the stone age so everyone is named stone uh <laughs> at first you're like this is going to be terrible how can you have every single character in your movie named stone every every <laughs> character named pierre and then it kind of doesn't really get old every time like you know an hour into the movie and they're still calling everybody pierre by the same name I feel like uh, kind of like that Family Guy humor where you dr if you drag it out long enough, eventually it gets over this hump and then becomes funny again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I started off not laughing and then, you know, just kind of it took me about an hour and 10 minutes to, to kind of tune into the, the humor of the film. By the end, I kind of thought it was all right. It was not bad. I actually, I actually laughed at a few points and I, I was kind of impressed that they they kind of committed fully to their uh, to their style of humor, um, but also that they um, they didn't just make it one of those caveman films where it's like two tribes are having a war and that's the main focus. That I thought it was quite interesting that they they tried to turn it into a, a kind of uh, almost Inspector Clouseau style detective mystery uh, by having the first murder, and that that kind of gave it a bit more interest than um, maybe you would have expected from from a, a kind of Stone Age comedy. It gave it a, a different hook, which was nice. That seemed to be more of the driving plot. The If you read the synopsis online, it usually suggests this about a war between the dirty hairs and the clean hairs over shampoo. But it turns out that's more of a background mm -hmm. story. And the by uh, about half an hour or 45 minutes into the movie, this uh, it fully becomes a, a murder mystery, like a very formulaic detective drama with the it, it's more a kind of columbo than a murder she wrote so it, it's very much you know who the murderer is and you have to figure out how they're going to going to entrap them uh, rather than work out who it is there's also the joke where they're sort of inventing new words or concepts so <laughs> this is the first crime and they've never had a crime before so the the chief uh decides to call it a, a crime he invents the word and then but they don't use it the way we use it today so they're looking for the crimer <laughs> uh, or they're looking for the person who crimed <laughs> and then uh when the uh uh blonde pierre and curly haired pierre become the uh detectives they're appointed the detectives by the chief they decide that uh they're not getting the respect they need because they're not they don't have a recognizable job uh, or a recognizable tool of their job like the other people like the uh Heliologist or the the watcher have you know their distinct job titles and their tools associated with that, and so they decide uh, that they need a symbol for their job, and they look into the water and they see a starfish, so they get their sheriff's star. I think the other one is wearing a sea urchin for some reason, and it's <laughs> it's painful when he flashes his badge. <laughs> yeah. So Josh, basically, uh, you can call me Pierre. You know. It sounds kind <laughs> of like Fedja for a foreign guy, I guess. Could be my, you know, French nickname. Pierre. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> One of the things that I noticed sort of late in the movie, uh, a lot of movies that have uh, bones, we always talk about the bones because that's what we're into. I didn't notice a lot until right at the end uh, in that uh, final scene when they're all shampooing in the water. But the chief and his wife are wearing sort of ceremonial outfits with skulls on them. Did you notice that, Ross? Uh, no, I only noticed the, the chief's wife's hair, which is pretty special. There were like, The heliologist wears a skull on his head, which is a, a made-up animal. It looks like a kind of yeah. pterosaur with teeth. And the, the, the curly-haired Pierre... Uh, whose curls aren't natural, um, uses uh, a furcula, a wishbone, as his hair curler, which was uh, quite funny. But no, I didn't know what were the skulls at the end. I didn't notice that at all. Well, uh, I'm not sure why they needed these special clothes right at the end, but the chief's wife is wearing a dress adorned with uh, turtle skulls over her breasts. 
right. uh, which I guess turtle skulls sort of are sort of they have this sort of concave back to them where they might you know fit over and their turtle skulls are really unique looking if uh, mm. listeners don't know what they look like so um, they kind of make the right shape for a bikini? bra part of a <laughs> yeah bikini <laughs> Uh, but she also has uh, baboon skulls sort of all over her skirt, uh, which mm. look to me like they're probably all real skulls or replicas of real skulls. They're not like just some fictional prop that somebody made up. And the what? chief also has some skulls on his uh, shirt, which um, seem to be some kind of monkey. I didn't get a close look at them, but they looked like some sort of monkey or lemur skull, possibly. Which wouldn't be very easy to get hold of, I'd imagine, unless... They have access to replicas somewhere. Oh yeah, I guess they are not real, real ones. If it was a lemur, you know, mm. <laughs> maybe not real skulls, but definitely uh, cast from real skulls. Or I guess this was two thousand four that this movie came out, so it's probably not three D printing today. It'd be really mm. simple to just download a baboon skull from Morphosaurus and three D print it <laughs> for free. <laughs> right. The clothing seems kind of fairly uh, appropriate to the time period they have nothing obviously anachronistic they have kind of uh furs and, and leathers um i don't see any kind of basket weaving or um things like that there's very little kind of technology shown um apart from uh the guitar that's made out of a <laughs> i think that looks like a horse skull and a and some vertebra um <laughs> there's one uh biface shown when they're when they carve up a hippo, uh, that's the only time I see any kind of stone technology. But apart from that, yeah, they're, they're and they're clubs, so they've got they've got kind of wooden clubs, which are fairly unsophisticated. But no, there's not a lot of technology on display. There's uh, implicitly sewing needles mm. uh, because the uh, victims' mouths, mouth and nose are sewn shut, and uh, <laughs> also one of the uh, the first. Uh, suspect was a seamstress guitarist, uh, but sewing needles first are first developed in the Upper Paleolithic. So thirty five thousand years is about the right time to for, to begin seeing sewing needles in the archaeological record. I don't know if we mentioned the the first sub suspect was a uh, guitarist seamstress because they knew that <laughs> the murderer uh, had experience with sewing needles, so they were looking for a seamstress. But then also, I guess the victims had been eviscerated or something, mm -hmm. and they were wondering what they would need the guts for. And they then uh, it was the uh, Guy, the dirty hair <laughs> in disguise, who suggested maybe they were using the guts for making guitar strings. So the mm. chief decided that they must be looking for a, a combination guitarist and seamstress. And then they did find a guitarist, a seamstress, <laughs> who was taking guitar and seam and and sewing lessons. At the same time, trying to learn how to play a guitar and sew at the same time. And then she became the first uh, suspect, which they just immediately decided uh, was the actual murderer, the actual crimer. And uh, then to have a celebration, they caught and ate that hippo. And it seems like they didn't know what to do with their murderer at the time. They're like, yeah, we caught the murderer. Let's all have a celebration. And the murderer is celebrating with them. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so so if I remember correctly, uh, do they use body paints uh, like ochre or something? Some some guys are red, actually, right? I think that the dirty hairs definitely use kind of clay or or ochre or some kind of mineral to coat their faces and their um, their hair. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which which is cool, I guess. It was a little confusing. I wasn't sure if the like the dirty hairs skin is just bright red the whole movie and their hair right. is matted with red clay. So I wasn't sure if they were meant to have red skin for the longest time, or if they were just dirty with red dirt, or if they were actually painting their skin red, but it doesn't seem like they were meant to just be biologically red skin because no, no. Uh, Pierre, the blonde uh, is uh, the son and brother of the, um, uh, the dirty haired people, but his, yeah. Yeah, of Guy and um, and a chimpanzee, uh, <laughs> but his skin isn't red, so it does seem like they must have been painting their skin. But also, when they were in their wat in the water and their 
uh, dirt wa- washed out of their blonde hair, their skin was still pretty red. It didn't seem like it was washing off easily. So maybe that's just the dye they used mm. for the movie. It didn't didn't wash out as easy as the hair. I'm not sure. I found it a little bit confusing about why their skin was so red. Yeah, but if you if you uh, Google images for uh, upper Paleolithic uh, graves, uh, you get uh, many of these which are like uh, totally uh, red with ochre. You know those Italian ones, etc. So maybe. This is yeah. the way they uh, got fam- the idea. Famously, Pabaland, which was excavated by Buckland in the Gower Peninsula in Wales, has the, the oh. Red Lady, which is... Right, um, right, right. The famous one. Which is not a lady, but is red. Um, right. And, and is completely covered in, in ochre. Um, I think I think those bones are in the Oxford Museum now, but yeah, they're obviously a very common and geographically widespread thing to cover um, bodies in, in ochre and give them a red yes, color. So, so that could be the idea. These were like mm. the graves of the dirty ones, you know, <laughs> of, <laughs> of dirty hairs. So are they, uh, if I remember again correctly, they're all barefoot. They don't uh, have any, any footwear, right? Yeah, that's right. No, there's no shoes. No shoes. There's no shoes except for in the uh, oh, yeah. um, the romance scene between the uh, chief and his wife when they're doing their little uh, dance and getting undressed uh, oh. in their cave. They're wearing basically entire fish on their feet, which <laughs> they uh, throw off uh, seductively. <laughs> Interesting. So the bit that I find the funniest, um, I kind of, I, d- I didn't fully switch into the kind of uh, the very French humor uh, until almost all the way through the film. But what I did find quite funny was when they're uh, staking out the bog, waiting for the uh, murderer. They have the this sequence where the chief is chasing after what he thinks is the murderer through the, the kind of reeds of the bog, and he ends up outside a carrefour, which is the, this big French uh, supermarket, uh, and he goes in, and it's all a bit weird. Like, uh, Given the kind of previous internal logic of the film, you didn't expect him to end up in a car for. And I was like, "What? Well, where's this going?" Uh, and he goes in, and he gets uh, he goes around all the, the sort of aisles and sees all the food, and then he gets accosted by um, a, a kind of customer service rep while he's looking at all the washing machines. <laughs> and it was just it was just like really weird. My kind of brain did a bit of a flip. I was like, "What is going on here?" But then uh, the chief kind of abruptly wakes up, and it was all just a dream. Which I thought was quite funny. I mean, you don't really, you, you kind of, uh, it's kind of an inverse of the, of the way that these kind of dreams usually work, where you have somebody in a modern day situation who might dream about the far future or the far past, but here you have somebody from the distant past uh, dreaming about <laughs> the modern day as a kind of a nightmare, which I thought was quite funny. Yeah, that was, that was a nice touch. Uh, that seems even more absurd because... When they're on the stakeout in the swamp, they're dressed up uh, as animals in disguise. So he's dressed up as a giant chick yeah. or a, a chicken uh, made of flowers and leaves. And so he's walking through this uh, this big box store covered in leaves, looking r- vaguely like a big yellow bird. <laughs> yeah, very odd. But there was other absurdist stuff like that. Like right at the beginning, the the text introducing the movie gives this description of a uh, heroic platoon in the Vietnam War. And uh, it says it ends by saying this is not their story. And then it just jumps into uh, the Paleolithic immediately. Oh. <laughs> the other thing about the uh, cave paintings is uh, they have a, the first time we see the cave paintings, they have a joke where uh, the children are all sitting in the cave staring at this cave painting and it's like they're they're glued to the TV set, but nothing is actually happening on the wall. And someone says, you can't watch the cave paintings all night. It's time to go to bed. <laughs> but isn't there some idea that a lot of the cave paintings were uh, made on the walls in such a way that if you had a fire, the light would dance over them and kind of make it look like they were sort of moving? Yeah, definitely. And there's there's quite a few papers that look at the kind of ideas uh, that that um, cave art was essentially early animation, um, not just kind of parietal art on the walls, but also mobile art as well. You have kind of examples of you know bowls which were designed to be spun. I mean, obviously these are much later, kind of Neolithic and later, but bowls that have kind of 
uh, cartoon-like images. I think there's one quite famous one of a goat, which it looks like it's jumping if you kind of spin the ball around. Um, it forms like a zoetrope, um, this kind of illusion trick where it looks like the image is actually animated. There's also yeah. kind of Paleolithic um, bone discs, which have two slightly dif- different images on either side, which are like uh, that, that toy called the, the Thomatrope, which is a fancy name for just a, a disc with some uh, string through it, which you kind of spin round and round. And then when you pull the, the cord tight, the disc spins round and, and your eye kind of blurs the two sides of the image and it looks like it's moving. The classic one is of the bird in the cage where you have an empty cage on one side and a bird on the other. And as it spins round, it looks like the bird's in the cage. Uh, and there's, there's an example of a bone disc from, I think, a French site uh, where it has um, two different views of some kind of wild animal on it, one with its legs extended and one with its legs kind of internal. And so it looks when you spin it, it would look like it was running. It looks like the legs are kind of going backwards and forwards. Uh, and then a lot of cave art as well has, has kind of, um, it looks almost like sketches because it has multiple outlines, um, which would have been really fascinating to watch by a kind of flickering torchlight uh, you may have got the same kind of effect that the light would illuminate um, like almost like a disco light and uh, a strobe effect almost. So it might look like it was moving if you were stand, standing there watching it. So yeah, I think there's quite a lot of evidence that uh, that joke's kind of quite close to the truth. That uh, happens a fair bit in the movies we are watching where something is played off as a joke, but it's like, actually, this might have been real. Like uh, the the pit burial for Cima de los Huesos as well. So one of the things in this movie is there's the chimpanzee, obviously, which is a real chimpanzee, which is always kind of sad because I don't think that we should actually be using chimpanzees as as actors. Uh, but also there's the baboon skulls at that one point. And uh, so I don't think we can actually situate this movie in space, but assuming that it's meant to be set in France because it's a French movie and we have Lascaux cave paintings, which are also found in France, most people like there's no apes or uh, monkeys living in Europe today apart from Gibraltar. Yeah. But there were during the Pleistocene and Peja and I have published a paper on monkey fossils from Serbia. Right. So uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised to find out that monkeys and apes actually did used to live in Europe during the Ice Age, but uh, not chimpanzees, obviously, because uh, chimpanzees only live in Africa. Uh, the apes that live in the apes that would have lived in Europe would be entirely extinct. But uh, Pedro, what kind of monkeys or apes would we reasonably expect to find thirty five thousand years ago in? France. <laughs> well, regarding apes, we would find Homo sapiens. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, and you know um, the macaques, which are uh, currently present at uh, the Rock of Gibraltar, were actually, uh, I think, the Romans actually first imported them there. So there, uh, the macaques used to live in in Europe until the early. I think placed to sin, but that when then went extinct, and actually were reintroduced by by the in the Roman times, I guess. And and British soldiers, I know the story, actually uh, thought that uh, if uh, the monkeys were gone from Rock of Gibraltar, so the British would be. So they repopulated at some point macaques from the North Africa, so. Their their symbol of kind of their presence there, basically, and yeah, and regarding the apes, uh, well, uh, by the early uh, the late Miocene, basically most of the apes uh, went extinct uh, in Europe. Apes other than than you know hominins. So we, from that point on, you had some uh, genera of uh, old world monkeys such as macaques, and there was before Dolichopithecus, Paradolichopithecus, and Mesopithecus. But yeah, during the Upper Paleolithic, <laughs> I don't think so, other than humans, you know? So there's another scientific inaccuracy in the movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Have baboons ever been found in Europe? Or are they a purely um, kind of African genus or family? No, no, no. No, yeah, but uh, the uh, the Paradolichopithecus genus, uh, which uh, I and Josh 
actually worked on on these fossils from from Serbia, they're basically uh, Papionin tribe. So they're kind okay. of uh, and uh, regarding part of the which lived basically during the Pliocene and early Pleistocene in Europe, including Serbia. Uh, he was a pretty large ape, uh, a large uh, sorry monkey, uh, the size of the largest uh, uh, baboons in Africa today. You know, so okay. basically they looked, uh, especially post cranially, they looked uh, and moved a lot like uh, a lot of like baboons, but there were no baboons in a strict sense in, in Europe. Okay. Cool. Well, Ross, do you have any more notes? Uh, uh, the hippo, they, they kind of hunt for the um, celebration of catching the crimer is also tusked as well, which is kind of weird since <laughs> hippos have tusks anyway. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was a bit of overkill. Um, but it's also huge. It's much bigger than an actual hippo is, uh, even though hippos are enormous. This thing's like about two or three times bigger than, than a, a real hippo. Um, that was a other note. One note is that when they, they kind of send Guy, the, uh, the dirty hair seductress, um, spy into the clean hairs, they, they kit her out by shaving a sheep. And uh, oh, yes. putting that on, <laughs> using the, the sort of fleece um, to cover her red paint, body paint and her her uh, hair with kind of fleece. Um, and the the sheep that they shave, when they kind of pan back to it, it's it's a pig. Uh, and, and one of them says that shaved sheep looks like a pig. And I wasn't sure if that was meant to be a joke or whether you know there are some uh, breeds of pig. Uh, I'm thinking of the Hungarian Margarita which have kind of a curly fleece. And so you would be able to sort of shave them to produce a, a kind of curly wig and, and uh, curly outfit. Um, but yeah, I wasn't quite sure. Maybe that's funnier if you're French. Uh, I don't I don't know. But that's about <laughs> the only other kind of notes I have. I mean, I think that it was quite good that they didn't, they, they kind of did play, you know, the Stone Age people are stupid, but they didn't do it to such an extent as some of the other films we've seen. I think the most kind of egregious example was when uh, Curly Pierre and Blonde Pierre are sitting kind of loafing beside the river and um, they're just avoiding the hunt and just um, kind of shooting the breeze. Uh, and Curly Pierre uh, pulls a tangerine off the tree and peels it and then throws <laughs> away the tangerine and eats the peel. Uh, that was the worst it got in terms of, you know, uh, slandering all these um, Paleolithic people as being stupid. But yeah, for the most part, they kind of. They, they did it in a different way, in a very different way from any of the kind of American or, or British films that we've seen, which um, kind of portrayed Stone Age stupidity, in inverted commas, in a very kind of different different manner. But yeah, I th I, obviously they, they did have lots of jokes about that, but um, it didn't feel too uh, terrible compared to other films. Um, yeah, so... And then, so so, sorry, in the context of, of the food, there was this particular scene when uh, they were like munching on on a, a mammoth uh, proboscis, like some kind of snack, you know, <laughs> it stuck in my head, basically. It was the really funny. Drunken pickle, I think it was. Um, oh, yeah, drunken pickle, pickle, right. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, what's, what's just reminded me is that they have this tree, this tangerine tree beside the river, uh, but my understanding is that tangerines are a, a very recent phenomenon that there's no such thing as a wild tangerine it's a it's yeah, a hybrid yeah. from the pomelo which is the wild fruit and various other kind of citruses so that that's something that that kind of s slipped in there uh, yeah, as well. and anachronism for sure like many for sure <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on that note pickles also uh true wouldn't have existed i mean i don't know what the uh wild uh, version of a cucumber would look like, but I don't know also when uh, canning and fermentation would have uh, uh, been invented. I don't know when the earliest pickles well, would exist. Pickles, you need vinegar, don't you? And for, to, to kind of mm -hmm. produce vinegar, you need to have wine production, something that you can then I turn mean, for, into. Firstly, into firstly, you need to have pots, you know, in which you could mm -hmm. put yeah. uh, food to get fermented. Yeah. So, so it's at least post-Neolithic then, 
or it, very, very latest Upper Paleolithic. Yeah, 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 for sure. No pickles in the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> but pickled trunks? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds well, plausible, I mean, there, there, you know? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, Dan Fisher in the States did some uh, work on uh, not quite pickling, but fermenting um, meat. So oh. the idea that oh, quite yeah. often you find uh, kind of bones of mammoths and other uh, animals disarticulated or partially articulated in what would have been small, uh, shallow ponds. And, and his idea was that this was actually um, kind of Paleolithic food storage, that people would find mm small ponds that were cold year round submerge uh some some mammoth flesh or some you know uh mastodon flesh at the bottom weight it down come back six months later uh and after scraping off all the the kind of rot on the Mm. surface that that low constant temperature would have meant that some of the meat would still be edible um if you were hungry enough and i think actually dan fisher uh, I saw a program where he tried this himself, and it looked absolutely disgusting. Like he he put <laughs> some bison or something in this pond for six months, took it out. It was totally green, uh, scraped off like all this kind of uh, you know algae and uh, you know leech and other kind of bug infested outer surface, and then cooked a little bit of the inside and survived. Mm. I mean, Dan Fisher is still alive today. Oh, but yeah, sounds I mean, delicious. That's, Oh, I had uh, uh, some uh, uh, some. Uh, I have some understanding uh, of of what that could possibly taste like because uh, just last year, me and my friends uh, tried the, the famous surströming from from uh, Sweden pickled fish, right. which mm. is basically smells like like the death itself, and <laughs> it tastes tastes. Uh, well, horrible, salty and uh, uh, kind of uh, a salty gasoline, like you know. Mm. I'm <laughs> but it didn't really... kill you. No, no, it did not. It's edible, basically. Yeah. So it evolved as a way to preserve uh, fish, uh, which would be uh, fished from the Baltic Sea seasonally uh, in large mm. uh, quantities. So they had to find some means of preserving it so i guess that's not out of the realm of uh, possible you know to have yeah. uh, that kind of uh, practice to so you, preserve you could get you could get a pickled trunk perhaps but i mean i've, I've worked with <laughs> yeah. a, a whole bunch of of swedes and, and icelanders and you know this this stuff is horrific the the, the swedish um pick um rotted herring you know Surströming, it's written yeah. into many um leases like if you're if you're renting a a flat yeah. in Sweden, you're not allowed to open this within no opening the building. Within the premises, right. It, yeah, it, you, because you, it, it, you, will, it will last forever. And the, the Icelanders that I've worked with, they, they have something similar, but it's um it's kind of rotted shark, which is kind of preserved in urea. Um, and I've Ooh. been assured by, by people that have, uh, by the Icelanders that have eaten it, that it's delicious. Um, but I think everyone else with the working um, sense of smell would disagree with that. <laughs> my family is uh from iceland about four or five generations ago and i've never had that but uh where i'm from we have just like dried codfish from iceland and it's not fermented or uh anything like that it's just dried codfish but like i would like sometimes take some of this to school and i would like eat it with butter and when you open up the container it just smells like <laughs> dead fish it tastes really good, so like <laughs> I'm I'm open to the possibility that something can sound really gross and taste good. But I, bet I think fermented at shark is a little that. different from dried codfish. I was yeah, I was absolutely not popular at school. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody go on to become a scientist who was a popular kid at school? No, oh. no, I don't think so. <laughs> Pedro probably was popular at school. <laughs> well, actually, uh, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the food so i was uh, recently watching this uh, a youtube clip uh, in in yakutsk in russia they they eat a uh, frozen fish they simply just slice uh, like make thin long fillets and eat it straight away it's you know there are many ways to eat to eat animals yeah <laughs> 
the French would know that for sure. Yeah. A, a friend of mine um, did some field work in, in Yakutsk, uh, and he was there, you know, camping along riversides for, for oh. I think, six or eight weeks. But uh, I don't think, I think it was during the summer, so it wasn't cold enough to freeze the fish, but they basically lived off, you know, dried salmon that they just caught and then dried right, on a right. line overnight. And he, he's not eaten salmon since that day uh, that he left, <laughs> just because he had it so much that he was entirely sick of it. Um, and, you know, salmon is lovely, but I don't think I could eat it dried every day for, for six weeks. Uh, that would do it for me as well. <laughs> So in the end, what do we think about this movie? Uh, it's better than I was expecting it was going to be. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I as often with the, the comedy films that we watch, I go into it with like a kind of stony face, not expecting to laugh at all. And I, um, it took me a long time to even crack a smile. But after about the kind of hour mark, I kind of got into it and, and uh, ended up quite liking it. Um, you know, it, it tried to do something a bit different. And it's always interesting sort of seeing different cultures, uh, comedies, you, you kind of get um, an insight into how their their kind of culture works just by seeing what, what they find funny, which is always a treat. So, yeah, I, I was actually, uh, I watched that movie for the first time uh, when I was archaeology student. And I, I remember that it was uh, hilarious to me. So that's the reason why I actually made a, you know, proposed it uh, proposed to Josh to, to watch uh, this particular movie. So I would definitely recommend it. It's a funny watch, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> but I assume we all watched it with the English subtitles? Oh, yeah. yeah. I did. Which were pretty high quality. Yeah, I have a feeling it would have been a lot funnier if my French were stronger, though, because there's a lot of puns mm -hmm. in it, and I think I missed a lot of things. There was a few parts that seemed confusing, like even the um, the P whole Pierre joke kind of hinges on the fact that Pierre means stone in French, so l'âge de Pierre is the Stone Age, and so that's why everyone is named Pierre. Or the Peter The English age. translation calls everybody, yeah, ev the tr English translation calls everybody stone, or it kind of flips back and forth, calling people Pierre or Stone in the mm. subtitles. Mm. But there were there were other scenes, like there's one where uh, the the chief tells the guy to freeze in the subtitles, and then he starts like posing for the camera. So there must be some French word that where the word for freeze or pose is is the same in French, which I my French isn't strong enough to to have gotten that joke fully. Yeah, well, it's always it's always hard to translate comedy uh, to different yeah. languages. Uh, I remember watching uh, a famous Serbian comedy movie with English subtitles, and I was what? <laughs> that <a>, doesn't <laughs> sound right at all. You know, no one would get it. So yeah, there there is this slight uh, barrier. You know, you cannot get into everything from the movie if you don't know French very well. But yeah. It's worthwhile, definitely. And remember to shampoo your hair frequently. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you, if hey, Joe, I think you should go a week between shampoo because you got to get the natural <laughs> oil in it to keep it nice yeah, yeah. and so, uh, uh, smooth. The, the thing, I, I must correct myself. Uh, okay, it was like a week uh, that I hadn't washed my hair, but I was... Uh, in the field, so I got really, really dirty. Not just, you know, doing regular things in in the office. It would be so hard to, you know, I guess, <laughs> don't wash your hair for a week at home. But uh, you know, in a field. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I think I wash my hair at least every second day in the field. Yeah. So you get my point then. So you could you uh, you know you could do an experiment. People could do that. You know, just try not. Uh, I I think that we don't uh, uh, appreciate much the hygiene. You know that we actually have. We take it for granted. But uh, yeah. if you find yourself in a situation when where you cannot you know brush your teeth or, or wash your hair or whatnot, so you will remember that and when i when i uh, when i was a kid uh, uh i think th this particular issue uh, was 
is with me since I was a kid. And I still, I still think about it. You know, uh, we are always, when we think about the past, being, you know, Roman times or Paleolithic or whatever, we tend to, uh, you know, uh, imag- at least I do, to imagine it uh, in, in, in a, you know, Hollywood kind of way. But if you get down to the real stuff, like not having, uh, you know, uh, water for drinking, like not having soap or shampoo, <laughs> you know, you get to the real core of what, uh, how hard was uh, was the life in the past and, and, you know, how hard did these people were. Yeah. Uh, well, one kind of corollary to that is that, uh, and something that I think that uh, Jean Ull does really well in the Clan of the Cape Bear books, is the idea that, you know, even though they, they didn't have soap or shampoo as we know it today, there would have been natural products like plants high in saponins that they could uh, use as a kind of a natural uh, hair care product or natural kind of soap. Um, and so th- e- even though we, it, it's sort of tempting to think of the distant past as a, a kind of dirty place, people would have been just as interested in hygiene for the most part as we are today. And there would have been a kind of natural solutions or at least part, partial solutions to um, kind of keeping some sense of cleanliness, um, assuming that people were close to water, which they almost always were. Um, so that, that's something that sticks with me from reading the, the kind of clan of the cave bear books is the idea that, you know, some some plants are very high in kind of natural um, cleansing agents, essentially. And you can just uh, pick up a few when next time you go down to the river and that's, that's you kind of got your shampoo and soap all in one uh, ready for use. Mm. But yeah, if, if one could travel back in time, I think we would need quite some time to get used to <laughs> the lack of <laughs> hygiene and the aromas of everything, of people and, and the habitats, and, and, etc. Yeah. So, yeah, so kids, brush your teeth, wash your hair, keep your hygiene. <laughs> If you've been enjoying Screens of the Stone Age, get in touch with us. Follow us on Twitter at SOTSA underscore podcast and on Facebook at SOTSA podcast, or send us an email to screensofthestoneage at gmail.com. Screens of the Stone Age is supported by the Paleoanthropological Society of Canada. Find out more at pasc-scpa.ca.